In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to build an incredible gaming PC for just a shave over $900, featuring none other than an RTX 3060. With GPU prices now crashing through the floor, there's arguably not been a better time to build a gaming PC in the last two years, and more budget, value-oriented builds that pack an incredible performance punch are now finally possible. In this video, I'll be walking and talking you through all the parts I've selected, just how exactly exactly you can build a system for this price point right now and cover it off performance a little bit later too. Let's do this. Ebuyer's NVIDIA GeForce Week has landed, with great deals now available on GeForce RTX 30 Series GPUs. Pick yourself up the 3060 in this video, or heck, a great deal on a 3060 Ti, but only while stocks last. Learn more at the first link in the description below. Now let's kick things off, shall we, by taking a look at our GPU and CPU combo. These are the two most important and detrimental parts when it comes to gaming performance, and will largely define what you're able to achieve in any of the latest titles. Of course our other components are important and we'll come on to those but these are the really crucial bits. For the processor I've picked up the Intel Core i5 12400F. This is the cheapest 12th generation i5 CPU you can find that still boasts fast clock speeds and awesome gaming performance. The F just means the CPU's got no included graphics, something we don't need anyway because of our dedicated gaming GPU, and the processor isn't overclockable. But that's fine, it's still going to outperform the likes of an overclockable AMD Ryzen 5 chip, at least from the 5000 series, by a solid margin. It matches up absolutely perfectly with our GPU, MSI's Ventus RTX 30. Now the RTX 3060 is a really unique card in terms of its market positioning. It provides a massive performance jump over something like an RTX 3050, but does lag significantly behind the likes of a 3060 Ti. It makes it a perfect middle ground GPU for those looking to max out 1080p gaming at high settings and above. Over in the States there's some great deals to be had on these cards, and here in the UK right now, eBuyer have got deals on these for a little over £300. That's actually believe it or not, below MSRP for a 3060, and this MSI Ventus 3X model is included in those deals. Now we'll be installing the GPU in a few moments time and looking at the specific MSI cooler, but before then we're going to go ahead and pop our motherboard into place. Now I've done something just a little bit controversial, I've gone for an MSI graphics card and a gigabyte motherboard. Hold the phone, that seems like a weird choice. Now to be clear, MSI have got some great B660 designs that will work well with our Intel chip, but the gigabyte B660 DS3H is quite simply one of my favourite motherboards ever. Now that might sound weird coming from a guy who's literally got all of the latest motherboards for Intel and AMD, including $600, $700 units or even this $1500 Z690 godlike. Why then is this fairly plucky $150 gigabyte UD series board one of my favourite designs ever? Basically, it's really cheap but still gives you awesome performance. With support for all the latest in Intel 12th gen processors, it has of course got an LGA 1700 socket, you've got PCI generation 4 and generation 3, and I don't want to be, you know, presumptuous, but there's quite a lot of them. I wonder what perhaps six months ago Gigabyte were thinking when they designed this board. I will let you guys make the decision on that one. It has though got four RAM DIMM slots, including support for dual channel memory, great for extra memory bandwidth. you got Gen 4 NVMe slots as well, one at the top here and one down the bottom. And then if we flick over to the very back of the board, Board, you've got a strong I.O., including USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type A and Type C, basically the fastest USB ports in the small and the bigger flavour. You've got Wi-Fi 6 as standard as well, making sure you get super fast Wi-Fi transfer speeds. And although you are missing features like an optical audio out, which may be a deal breaker for a very small number of people, it's still going to tick a lot of boxes in my book. And, did I mention, pretty cheap. One thing I have done with this build to make sure it's super cheap and stays affordable is I've stuck with the Intel stock cooler. That's for a couple of key reasons. It's going to be fine for a CPU that we can't overclock anyway. Normally a great cooler would allow you to push the processor that bit further. We simply don't need that today. And of course it comes included with our processor for free. You could easily spend $80 on an aftermarket liquid cooler, but there's frankly no point unless you're going to also upgrade the CPU, something we don't really need to do to get the most out of our 3060. With this in mind, the simple stock cooler is going to do us nicely, and it will have pre-applied thermal paste on 
it if it's brand new. Clip each of the four corners in, add in your fan header, and the CPU and CPU cooler are ticked off. Nice and easy, nice and quick. This is a really simple build to put together, which I know for a lot of first time builders will be a big <sighs> sigh of relief. With a build like this, there's actually loads that we can install now while the motherboard is out of our case and easy to access. And the next of those components is our memory. I've gone for this Gale, Gale, Gile, let me know in the comments, Orion RGB memory kit. Now it's available in a dashing red, or let's be honest, a little bit more of a subtle dark gray or black. It has got a Ryzen logo on. I don't really know why. I think it's certified to work well with AMD CPUs, but from our experience and testing works absolutely fine with the Intel counterparts. And it's gonna fit really, really nicely within this build. Pull back your clips on the round dim slots on both sides. We'll be using the gray slots today as these are the ones that are going to give us a better element of dual channel performance and higher clock speeds from the outset. Don't put your round dims directly next to each other as this can cause them to run on different channels and give you not an optimal amount, shall we say, of performance. While we're here, we're also going to go ahead and pop in the M.2 storage. The M.2 storage has become increasingly important in a build because it can create a bottleneck with your other components if it's not fast enough. This is the WD Blue SN570, and it's a great budget-oriented M.2 drive. With read and write speeds in the region of three and a half gigabytes per second, it's gonna perform very well as far as boot-up times go, and gives you top-end performance from a Gen 3 NVMe. The 3060 is a good match for this storage, but if you did run up to a 3070 or 3080, you would want a slightly faster SSD again, just to make sure the whole build is well-balanced and optimized. Go ahead and install this into your motherboard, using the pre-installed standoff screw, fasten it down into place, and your storage is completely installed. No pesky cables or wires to deal with, it's all gonna be through our motherboard today. Once your motherboard assembly is all complete, with your CPU, cooler, RAM, and your SSD all nicely installed, we can go ahead and pop this into the case choice. I've gone ahead and picked up Deepcool's CK540, an ATX tower with a load of RGB, plenty of mesh for good airflow, and a great price point. We've done lots of content on our website and YouTube channel covering the best cases that you can buy in 2022 for different color schemes, build form factors, and just about everything in between. I love this deep cool chassis though. It makes an awesome choice for this build with loads of great features, an awesome layout, and plenty of cable management runs too. As I would do in all of our gaming PC builds, the first step with any case is to go ahead and remove all of those side panels. That includes the tempered glass side panel on the one side, and then the rear steel panel on the other two. Lay the chassis flat onto your work surface or table of choice, and then locate the IO shield that comes with your motherboard. This will be available by default in your motherboard's box, but high-end motherboards may also have this built in, alleviating this step of the process. Because I've gone for a full-size ATX version of this motherboard, all of my standoff holes should match up with the standoffs pre-installed inside the chassis. A quick look reveals that, yep, yeah, these are all in the right place. Essentially, if any are not in the right place and are not going to line up with the holes on your board, go ahead and move them as they can cause grounding issues which is just not going to end well. Slide the board into place, pop it over the standoffs and screw it in. Take this step by step, start with the center standoff and work your way out. If it's not seated quite correctly, feel free to unscrew these and do them again. They can be a bit picky and we want to make sure we get this right. While the case is actually laid down flat like this, I'm going to go ahead and install the graphics card. Now I alluded to earlier about the choice to go with a 3060, specifically MSI's Ventus 3X model. Now now, we've partnered up with NVIDIA and eBuyer who kindly supplied this card and made us aware of some of the deals currently available here in the UK on eBuy.com and around the world at other retailers. To see these cards finally hit such pricing is awesome to see, and with the RTX 3060 not rumoured to be replaced with the first tranche of next-gen GPUs, this could be an awesome card to buy now, especially for those of you who are a bit more price conscious. Think about it, if you buy, say, a current-gen 3090 Ti, only for it to be red placed or outdated in a few months time, you might be quite disappointed. But for those on the budget end of the market, buying last gen's card, which isn't even last generation yet, has been common practice for years. After the launch of the 3060, people were still buying the 2060 Super because it was an awesome GPU. And the same goes here. I really like this design of card because although it's thin, it's still fairly beefy in terms of cooling capacity, with a large heatsink extension right of our GeForce text, a nice backplate to stop the thing from sagging, and a pretty sleek two slot form factor. What I'm going to go ahead and do is push back the clip on our PCI 
PCI retention socket, that's this one just here, and then slide the graphics card into place. If you drop it in and apply a bit of pressure, it will click in nice and easily, and then we can go ahead and screw it down over on the left hand side, where typically we'd have a couple of PCI lane covers. I always find this stage is quite difficult because you're trying not to sort of drop the screw inside your case only for it never to be found again. This one fits in our build A-OK, -okay, and you've even got room if you wanted to, to add an all-in-one liquid cooler at the front here with a fan on one of the sides, and you're still going to be A-OK. -okay. You might not be able to see this too well, but this case also has a GPU support bracket, which we can push up like so, tighten into place, and that will stop the thing from sagging. Not quite so much of an issue when it's laid down flat on a table, but lift it up, and you can see here that without support over time, this will sag and droop. So we're going to adjust that bracket like so, and that should keep our GPU a little bit more firmly into place. Once that's in, there's only one major component left to go, and that's the installation of the power supply. Now this is a Corsair CX650F, and as the name suggests, it's a 650 watt unit. It's 80 plus bronze certified as well, 80 plus are the official body that recognise efficiency levels in power supplies, something we've explored in greater detail over on geekwatt.com, where you can learn what the difference is between 80 plus bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and just about all the other levels they've got nowadays. There's so many, it's hard to explain in 10 seconds, and I'll leave those links down in the description below. The power supply is also modular, meaning we only have to plug in the cables we actually need to. We've covered in great detail before how to go ahead and get your build wired up, so we won't cover it in too much detail here. Just make sure that your motherboard, CPU, and GPU all have the power they need from your power supply, and make sure you keep hold of any excess cables that you're not using, as future upgrades may mean that you need to add these into place to provide a bit more wattage where possible. This power supply could last you years and years and years, without necessarily needing to be upgraded. Throw this in, get all those wires connected, and then we're basically ready to turn the thing on for the very first time. Once we've seen what it's like when it's all powered up, we are of course going to take a deep dive into performance and gaming benchmarks. So stay tuned and don't go anywhere. Before that though, there's only one thing for it. It's time for an awesome Geekleheart montage. <laughs> stuff. Now that we've seen just how good this system looks, it's time to see whether the performance numbers stack up. And the whole thing actually performs how we'd expect. Otherwise, essentially, what's the point? On your screen now is a summary of all the games we tested, all the results at 1080p high settings across the board. Where DLSS was available, we enabled it. Where ray tracing was available, we disabled it with a couple of exceptions. If we take a look at a few of these titles in a bit more detail, let's start off with Spider-Man first off. A brand new title, the newest game on our list, and we tested here at 1080p high with DLSS set to quality and ray tracing enabled. DLSS is of course Nvidia's tech which helps us to supercharge our frame rates. While the inclusion of ray tracing here was enabled because it really does enhance this game. It adds awesome reflections to all the skyscrapers and buildings as you swing on through and as a big Spider-Man fan that makes me very happy. And with RTX enabled on our 3060 we're getting 145 FPS on average. When tested of course at 1080p with strong 90 and 99 percentile results for good measure. A similarly good results are available in the likes of Battlefield 2042, where at 1080p high settings with DLSS enabled and set to performance mode this time, we pulled in more than 100 FPS on average, 104 frames to be precise. The good results carried on rolling in, COD Vanguard next up, 1080p high, a bit of DLSS, yes please, 155 FPS on average was the flavour of the day. The game looked awesome and this is of course a nice competitive frame rate. The good results carried on swinging through, get the Spider-Man pun, in Apex Legends, where at 1080p high, we pulled in 148 frames per second. Very tidy. Good 90 and 99th percentile results as well, really helped things along, and the whole thing looked awesome. Super competitive frame rates in Apex, which is something I was really glad to see. Moving on through to Fortnite next up, at 1080p competitive settings, and here we achieved over 180 frames per second. DLSS was enabled, everything was set to low, apart from the render distance, which was set to far to 
ensure maximum competitive advantage. 184 FPS on average was an awesome result and a set of frames that I was really personally very happy with. Finally, to wrap things up, we also tested out a little bit of Call of Duty Warzone. Here we pulled in 143 FPS at 1080p high with DLSS once again enabled. It's great to be hitting these 140 FPS marks. Of course, awesome for high refresh rate monitors and of course setups that can really help you achieve that competitive edge. And with that, that pretty much wraps it up for this one. Thanks for tuning in. Get subscribed to see more from us. And as always, we'll see you next time.